Here he is. She's recording the meeting. <laughs> You're going to be famous, Michael. Oh, I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> Good well, to hear. On, on behalf of the Paxville Qualicum Canadian Federation of University Women, I'd like to welcome and uh, to you to our meeting. And Michael and I have been talking about this for a long time. Michael was one of those speakers that I actually booked, I think, before COVID even happened. Mm -hmm. we, we talked about how he would get here and how I would take him out for a meal and all these lovely things. And now he's just here stuck on Zoom. So I feel a bit guilty about that. But I guess this is one of the things we've got to get over in this day and age. So without further ado, I'm going to let Michael speak. And, and I think because he's probably more qualified in introducing himself and to what he is going to speak about, I am going to let him do that. So, Victoria. I'm going to mute everybody. And then, Michael, if you could unmute yourself, and then uh, we should be good to go, OK? Sounds good. All right. Okay, Michael, if you want to unmute yourself. Okay, there we are. Yep. And um, we will, um, is my screen being shared now? It is. Uh, you might want to go full screen. Yeah. Great, there it is. So I will, um, uh, I'll, I'll introduce myself here, and um, as I'm as I'm going through the uh, the, the presentation, um, I may not be able to see folks, so feel free to uh, uh, either Val or Victoria, feel free to uh, uh, kind of jump in if there's if there's questions in the chat or, or elsewhere, and I'm happy to pause at, at any time. Um, but uh, I'd, I'd thank you for for inviting uh, me to here, here today uh, to uh, share this uh, space with with everyone. Um, I'm uh, I'm presenting to you today from the uh, the territory of the the territory of the Coast Salish people, um, and it's always a pleasure to share information with uh, with interested parties. So I look forward to um, uh, you know sharing this information and and also any any conversation and uh, and uh, Q and A that that happens after the fact. Um, I am the uh, communications manager with uh, Western Canada Marine Response. So I've been with the organization for um, uh, coming on six years now. Uh, I was initially, um, prior to this, I worked for a communications firm uh, uh, that did uh, media relations for, for clients. And uh, right around when uh, Northern Gateway was a uh, uh, hot topic on the coast, um, Western Canada Marine Response uh, approached our firm looking for some support with the, with the media side of things. So um, I was the uh, I was the lead on that account and uh, uh, quickly uh, kind of realized that there was a lot more to be done than just media relations. So I came on full time about uh, about six years ago. Um, my um, my role with the organization is I mean, the title is communications. Uh, I would say about um, three quarters of my work is on the community engagement side of things. Um, I'm particularly focused on um, uh, emergency uh, emergency managers, uh, the municipalities, elected officials at, at all three levels of government. I uh, have a colleague who works uh, closely with uh, First Nations on, on the coast, um, but our, our, our focus is on coastal communities up and down uh, the entire coast of, uh, of BC, um, but with a particular emphasis on in, in over the last four or five years on the south coast because of um, uh, the uh, the Transnound project and, and our enhancements, which I'll which I'll be speaking to uh, a little bit later. Um, so that's that's uh, engagement is my primary role. Um, I still do uh, you know media relations for the organization. I, I speak to fine folks like yourselves. Um, I've been doing that uh, for for quite some time, and you know pretty much anything that's external facing will uh, uh, will find its way to my desk sooner or later. So. Uh, whether it's branding or that kind of stuff, it, uh, I typically have a have a have a hand in it. So that's uh, that's that's me. Um, what uh, what I'm hoping to do today is um, I've got about um, 
uh, 30 to 40 minutes uh, worth of, of slides and material. And uh, then once we, uh, once we go through those, um, we, can, uh, we can take some time to, to answer questions. Uh, that's often where some of the, uh, the, the more interesting conversations happen. Um, but this, uh, this presentation today, it, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's a presentation that I've been doing for a while. Uh, I've flushed it out uh, with a bit more detail for this particular audience because we have some time. Um, so we'll look at the uh, sort of the history of, of spills on the coast, uh, in particular, obviously the West Coast will be our focus. So uh, that's what we'll be looking at and just sort of uh, as, as, a, as setting the stage for some of the, uh, some of the, the stuff we'll be talking about later. Um, and then I'll get into the uh, sort of the legislative and regime um, side of things. So uh, what does the Canadian law look like when it comes to spills and particularly, um, probably even more importantly, uh, preventing the spills and, as well as responding to the spills. Um, and uh, I have some information here just on, on current shipping trends on the West Coast. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a prairie boy initially, so uh, getting into the shipping industry I've always found quite fascinating. Um, so just wanting to share some, some of the information that's going on so you get a sense of what's, what's actually out there right now on our, our coast. And then we'll get into us as an organization and you know, what kind of boats and equipment and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we'll look at our coastal response program, which is a, um, uh, a relatively new program for us, but it kind of gets into how we plan and prepare for spills, how we like, basically, you know, how, we, how we look to, uh, to protect the coast. Uh, then the Trans Mountain Enhancement. So uh, there's uh, obviously been a lot of chat about Trans Mountain over the last number of years, and, and we have certainly played a role uh, in those conversations. And um, with the, uh, the, the National Energy Board um, uh, approval of that project, there's some, some conditions that, that, that certainly apply to us. So we'll look at we're preparing for, for that increase in, in, in shipping traffic. Uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll talk about falsehoods and facts. So, uh, I've been doing these presentations for a while and, and typically similar um, questions come up. And so uh, that'll be kind of a starting point for, for looking into those. Uh, and then, like I mentioned, the, uh, the, the Q&A piece. All right. So a bit of a history here. So this is, um, uh, this, is, this is a spill that happened in 1973. Uh, you're looking at, uh, you can just see in the top left corner of the screen there, uh, Lionsgate Bridge. So this is just west of First Narrows in Vancouver Harbor. So you're looking across into the seawall there at Stanley Park. And this was an incident where uh, two freighters uh, ran into each other on their approach into, into, into First Narrows. So this collection of slides, again from 1973, basically shows sort of the state of oil spill cleanup at that time. Uh, this this was uh, might, might have been on the cover of Vancouver Sun, but I got these photos from the uh, some Vancouver archives. Uh, but you can see this is essentially this is just uh, people from North Vancouver who have taken it upon themselves to come down and clean up this spill. Uh, they brought their shovels. Some of them haven't even brought their shoes. Uh, they've been they were throwing peat moss on it and shoveling it into into barrels was the uh, was the extent of their their cleanup technology. So. Um, again, this is uh, this is looking in, into the North Shore there, uh, and so you can see how heavy the oil is there. This is this is what's called uh, bunker C. So um, when when two when two freighters have an incident, like in in this case, uh, it, they're they're not oil tankers, but they the fuel that they use uh, to power themselves is, is something called bunker C, uh, which is a very heavy fuel. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very energy rich, which, which is why the shipping industry um, has used it for a long time. Um, but it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's basically the dregs of the refining process. So it's not, uh, it's not a pretty product. It's being, um, it's being phased out now uh, as, as they're going to low sulfur fuels, um, but you will still, you'll still encounter this product even up until uh, you know, a year ago. Um, this, uh, moving forward a little bit, uh, we're looking at um, 1988 now. This is the Nestuka Barge. And 
it, uh, it collided with a tug uh, down in Grays Harbor. Uh, so that's sort of on the, uh, the west side of um, uh, Washington State, just south of us there. And uh, it was about 890 tons of oil was, was spilt um, in, from this incident. So this, this, uh, this, this barge was carrying a bunker. Um, when, I, when we speak in, in spill response, uh, we typically use tons as a measurement. Uh, so you know, obviously one ton is a thousand liters or about seven barrels. So um, the, the previous spill was about 190 tons. Uh, this particular spill uh, was about 890 tons. And um, this, was a, this was a huge, huge spill for, for the west side of Vancouver Island. Uh, there was oil all the way up um, almost up to Tofino from, from Washington State. So a very significant incident. And uh, it, uh, it, it triggered a number of different uh, measures that came into, came into play. Um, one was the, um, the recognition for a, a much closer collaboration between Canada and the or US. Actually, sorry, sorry, I should restate that, more between um, Washington State and, and BC. Uh, so collaboration at the provincial state level. Uh, they also put a um, uh, something called a rescue tug in at Nia Bay uh, to help uh, prevent incidents like this in the future. And uh, we saw a lot more, um, especially in the States, a lot more measures from the Department of Ecology came out. But this, this spill was quickly overshadowed by this spill. This is uh, an overhead shot of the Exxon Valdez. Um, I think most people are very familiar with that, uh, that spill uh, up, up in Alaska. And the size of this bill uh, just uh, you know, dwarfed what we were talking about before. Uh, there's, there hasn't been a sort of conclusive uh, size of this bill that's come out, but uh, if we're looking at eight, 890 tons with that Nustuka spill, we're looking here between 30 to 40,000 uh, tons of, of oil for the, for the Exxon Valdez spill. Uh, so it's just, just a massive calamity. And um, what, uh, what happened here and why this is sort of an important um, uh, milestone in Canada, uh, even though this was a, an, an American spill in, in Alaskan waters, because it was so close to Canadian waters, uh, we have actually, some of our vessels were involved in the cleanup, but it really was a wake up call also for the Canadian government, not only the American government, but also the Canadian government. And so a, um, a fellow named Brander Smith was dispatched to look into some lessons learned uh, from this from this incident, and uh, those lessons informed changes that were made to the Canada Shipping Act, which is um, where a lot of what the safety measures and, and response measures that I'm going to be talking about uh, originally came from. Uh, so these are changes that happened to the Shipping Act in in, in the mid uh, in the mid 90s. So uh, this is you know it was it was it was all the stuff that went wrong with this bill that uh, informed the safety measures that we that we have today. So getting more into the um, into the regime, so I was mentioning that the um, the Exxon triggered uh, a number of safety measures, and I'll be uh, you know we uh, at WCMRC are not involved in the safety and prevention side, um, but I obviously have awareness of what those measures are, so I'm happy to share them with you. Uh, we're we're more you know obviously we're on the response side if these if these measures have failed. Um, but in terms of what, what came into place, uh, we've got uh, international standards coming from the IMO, which is the international uh, shipping body, that were then downloaded, adapted into Canadian standards. We had uh, a vessel traffic system management between the US and Canada, uh, which, which came out of that. Uh, you had crewed, uh, sorry, uh, improved uh, marine communication and traffic services in terms of um, radar and whatnot. Uh, the introduction of port state control, which is essentially vessels calling on Canadian ports must meet Canadian standards. Um, so often you'll hear people talk about uh, uh, flags of convenience for, for, for vessels where they register um, as a vessel in a jurisdiction that doesn't have stringent control. Um, we eliminate that by, by having port state control in Canada, which means that vessel, no matter where it's flagged, where it's registered must meet Canadian standards before it can call on our, our ports. It also has to have all the safety plans and memberships in place that, uh, uh, that Canadian law requires. 
and uh, that's done through through Transport Canada. They 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 are responsible for that uh, through monitoring and inspections of of these vessels as they come into Canadian waters. For for tankers in particular, there is a requirement for tug escorts, and um, for um, uh, right now for the uh, the tankers calling on the port of Vancouver, uh, those escorts join at uh, Victoria and they they're they're brought up. Uh, they're tethered, which means the tug is actually attached to the vessel for part of the voyage and other parts of the voyage. Uh, they are uh, untethered and, and traveling along uh, beside them. Uh, then also the requirement for local BC pilots. So uh, similar to the tugs, a large vessel, uh, anything over um, 350 gross tons in terms of size. So it doesn't, again, doesn't matter what, what type, kind of vessel that is it must have a local BC pilot on board. So that's, it's when you see, when you look out at English Bay or wherever, you know, whatever, wherever, wherever you see the deep sea vessels, it's a local pilot that brought that vessel into, into berth. And then the, um, for the tankers in terms of design, uh, they now, uh, well, following Exxon Valdez, uh, had to have double hulls before they could enter Canadian waters. Um, so this slide just shows you the uh, that joint management uh, system that I that I that I mentioned there. Um, you can see if you're looking at the left hand side of the screen, uh, those those gray bars there. Uh, that's that's the beginning of the international shipping lanes. And as uh, as vessels are coming in, they're on one side of the border, and as they're leaving, they're on the other. So when we're looking at the international shipping lanes, we're not only talking about vessels coming to the port of Vancouver, but we're also talking about the vessels uh, that are heading uh, through Canadian waters, uh, often from Alaska, for example, tankers from Alaska uh, or deep sea vessels from, from Asia that are coming in and that are going south there to the, um, uh, to, to the ports in, in, in Washington state and, and the refineries as well. So the, uh, the agreement between the uh, two countries is that when the vessels are in the, uh, the, the green zone there, uh, they're monitored by um, uh, by radio traffic control out of Seattle, and when they're in the uh, sort of uh, patchwork zone there, it's Victoria that uh, uh, that monitors the vessel. So close co close close cooperation on both sides of the border. So when I mentioned the uh, the requirement for um, uh, for local BC pilots, this is the area where if, if those vessels are a certain size in these in these red zones, that's where they must have a local pilot on board. So that's a, that applies not only down to um, uh, the port of Vancouver, but up uh, to vessels heading into um, Prince Rupert and eventually those that will be going into uh, Kitimat. Now these, the, uh, the, the pilots are, I mean, essentially they are, they are the cream of the crop of the marine industry. Uh, they, um, they are the ones with the most experience. Uh, the, they're uh, you know, highly paid. Um, but it takes a lot of, uh, it, it, these, these guys are, they're, they're master mariners. <laughs> they, they know the coast in and out. And the tests that they have to take are, are unbelievable. So this is uh, a sample of a, of a, of a test that they'll, that they'll get. So we essentially given this piece of paper uh, and it's a small section somewhere on the BC coast. So we have 27,000 kilometers of, uh, of coastline. And so they're given a small section like this and they have to fill in every small piece of detail. So this is what they have to fill in. Not only where is it, what are the depths in those locations? Uh, are there any markers in those locations? Are there any shipping lanes? So they have to know all that information without books from, from, uh, from, from memory. So uh, these, these folks are, are, are extremely talented and know the coast extremely well. And this, uh, this selection of pictures shows you um, sort of what it kind of looks like to be a, a BC pilot. Uh, so you see at the, uh, at the far left there, um, the, uh, the pilots are essentially brought out uh, through a water taxi or a pilot boat uh, to, the, to the vessel. And then this sort of rickety, <laughs> rickety rope ladder is thrown over the side. And, and while, while both vessels are moving, they have to... Uh, uh, they have to climb that ladder to get onto the uh, onto the vessel. Um, in the middle of the screen, there they they bring with them their own equipment, um, so they're not relying necessarily on on the ship's equipment. They have their own technology that they bring with them. 
Uh, and then they're, and they're in charge. Once they're on that bridge, uh, they're, they're, they're in charge and, and they can tell the, the vessel captain what to do. The Canadian pilot has authority in that situation. At the top right, um, this is, uh, you're starting to see more of this. This is where uh, pilots are, are lowered onto the deck uh, by helicopters opposed to using the ladders, which is um, uh, it's preferred to do the helicopter. And that's the way, uh, the direction that it's going. It's just a safer way to, to do it. But it is, uh, uh, there is certainly a hazard there because the, as I said, the, the, the large vessels aren't stopping and it's done in all kinds of sea weather conditions. Uh, what we're looking at here is just an illustration of the escort escort tugs. Um, so these this this escort tug requirement only applies to tankers, so it does not apply to uh, cargo ships or um, uh, or container ships. So at the top there, that's that's uh, that's a C-SPAN tug that is tethered to that to that particular tanker. Now these these escort tugs are designed specifically for this task. Um, so the, the naval architects, and there's a renowned naval architect in Vancouver called Robert Allen uh, that specializes in designing these, uh, these kinds of escort tugs. They're very, very impressive vessels. So the next little of the slides here is just sort of an um, overview of, of the, the state of shipping in terms of volumes and, and, and traffic that we see on the coast. What kinds of traffic do we typically see? Uh, on the West Coast compared to uh, other jurisdictions for those that uh, don't have too much familiarity with, with the shipping side of things. So I like, this is not Vancouver or any, anywhere in Canada, um, but I do like to start with this, this image. This is, um, uh, this is the port of Rotterdam. Uh, so, um, you know, often I hear people are concerned about um, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the increase in, in, in traffic to the port of Vancouver. Um, and I can tell you, it, it just it pales in comparison to other jurisdictions in the world. So, the um, the Port of Rotterdam has uh, 80 deep sea vessel calls per day, um, and you can see how well they, they can they can maneuver those vessels. Whereas, if you look at the Port of Vancouver, it's currently the Port of Vancouver currently has nine uh, new vessel calls per per day, uh, and they anticipate over the next couple of years that might go up to 12. So. Um, we're looking at uh, 80 you know, compared to 9 to, to 12 for the Port of Vancouver. So uh, it may seem like a busy our Vancouver port may seem like a busy port to to us, but it's you know in the grand scheme of things, it's it's actually uh, not as busy as some of these other jurisdictions. It is the busiest in Canada, mind you. Um, so in terms of what makes up that uh, that that traffic, um, when we're looking at the um, uh, at the top there, when we're looking at the port of Vancouver in particular, and this is now in relation to tankers and, and Trans Mountain. Uh, so, so right now, the um, uh, there's a roughly about uh, five tankers calling on the port of Vancouver per month, and that's going to go up to 34 with the um, uh, with the with the new project. So uh, that's going to go from. Uh, I'm not sure if I can see that correctly. I think it's around. 6% right now, up to 14% uh, of the total ship traffic. Um, so that's for the Port of Vancouver. Now, if we look at the Juan de Fuca Strait, so that's those international shipping lanes again. Uh, in, in 2012, so prior to uh, the, the Trans Mountain Enhancement, uh, we're going to have roughly, roughly per year around 5,500 transits through the Juan de Fuca Strait there, that, those international shipping lanes. Um, so all tankers, so this would include tankers coming from Alaska, it's about 600 of those um, are, um, are tankers. And then out of that 660 were Trans Mountain tankers. So the Trans Mountain tankers were about 1.1% uh, of the overall shipping traffic in, um, prior, to, prior to the, um, the expansion. And after the expansion, uh, you're going to be looking at uh, about 6.6% of all large vessels will be will be Canadian tankers um, after the enhancement. Now, if we go down to the last graph there, this this comes from um, uh, an organization called Clear Seas, which uh, was created a number of years ago to do research into more sustainable, uh, responsible shipping. So they do great original research into not only tankers but shipping of all of all kinds. So if you look at, and these numbers are, are prior to the, enhance, uh, to the expansion, but uh, the amount of uh, oil um, uh, transported or, or shipped on the uh, BC coast 
uh, is 6 million tons prior to Trans Mountain. The, um, currently, the amount of US shipped oil, so, so US uh, oil coming through our waters is 37 million tons. Uh, and then if you look on the east coast of Canada, all told it's 102, uh, 192 million uh, tons of oil that is, that is shipped. So uh, far higher volumes, uh, certainly currently uh, out in, on the east coast for, uh, for Canada. I won't spend too much time on this one. This just shows you, it's sort of a, basically it's a heat map of, of vessel, uh, I guess, uh, density. So uh, how many vessels per 100 nautical mile? And obviously the darker the, darker the, um, the lines, the more, uh, the, 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 the higher volume of, of vessels. So these, these maps will start to make a bit more sense as we, as we look into where WCMRC has, has assets. So uh, as you can see, obviously the, the, the thickest and darkest lines are in, in those international shipping lanes, not surprisingly, and then also up in Prince Rupert. Uh, Prince Rupert is growing uh, exponentially as a, as a port. It's on track to be the third biggest port in Canada uh, in, in the near future. So uh, a lot going on up there, particularly around um, uh, containers. So this, um, this is a similar, similar idea here, except what we're breaking it down by color, by uh, type of uh, vessel. So the, the purple lines coming in are uh, cargo vessels. So that could be container ships, uh, grain carriers, the like. Uh, the yellow lines are the tugs. Um, so that could be uh, a tug carrying a barge. It could be a tug escorting, uh, doing any other um, you know, type, of, uh, type, type of activity. Uh, the green are the crews, and then the blue are the the, the tankers. Again, uh, both Canadian and um, and American tankers in that situation. And this last uh, heat map is um, uh, represents the volume of oil that is shipped on our coast. Now, this is um, it's not just shipped; it's um, carried as cargo or fuel. So we talked a little earlier about the, um, you know, the bunker C for us as spill responders. Uh, that's obviously is a, a source of concern as much as a, as a tanker. Um, so we want to get a capture. We want to capture the the total volume of oil that's being uh, transported again as fuel or as cargo. So uh, once again, you can see that it's, it's thickest around those international shipping lanes at the bottom, and, and then up again in Prince Rupert. Now, in terms of the uh, the sort of projected uh, traffic management. So we are seeing more volume coming through the port of Vancouver. Um, it is a very um, is a very active port. It's a very versatile port. Um, but the overall um, so the blue line is the overall tonnage. Um, the orange line is the number of vessel calls. So you can see that the the tonnage is is going up quite a bit, whereas the vessel calls. Are, are staying you know, relatively relatively stable. And the main reason for that is these ships here. So this is a, this is a container ship. And um, the, um, the, the containers are often called uh, TEU is the, is the measurement that, that, that they use. And the, um, the Port of Vancouver, the biggest container ship that they can handle is one that holds 10,000 uh, TEUs. So that's 10,000 uh, container ships. The, um, the Port of Prince Rupert has recently in 2017, uh, they expanded their container terminal uh, to be able to handle uh, vessels that have 20,000 uh, TEUs. So, um, so they, were, they were, went through an expansion. Uh, a couple of years after their expansion was, was complete, there's already container ships out there that do 24,000 TEU. So this is uh, the, the size of these vessels just keeps growing and, and growing and growing. And, and certainly Vancouver is, is, is uh, uh, unable to accommodate some of these, these bigger container ships. Uh, just an, a note about, about tankers. So the, um, the Westridge project, the, uh, the Trans Mountain project, it, it is situated, that terminal is situated under uh, Lionsgate, but also under Second Narrows Bridge. So it has to go under two bridges to get to the um, uh, where the terminal is. And because of those uh, those restrictions, 
the largest size vessel that can go through that area is an, what's called an Aframax uh, tanker. Um, so that, that's the, uh, there's a, there is a size restriction on the, the, the tankers that call there. So um, they are, they're not the uh, very large CCCs, the VLCCs, the very large crew carriers that can carry close to 2 million barrels. They're the Aframax, which carry around 750,000 barrels. And they actually have to be, um, they can't be loaded up uh, full either. So that they are about 75% of, uh, of, uh, of that capacity. Um, now, the, um, this slide essentially shows you the, how that, those marine safety systems that we talked about earlier have had, actually had an impact on, on, on the safety of spills. And this is worldwide. Uh, here, we're, we're not just looking at the BC data here, this is worldwide data. So at, at the top there, um, uh, the, the red line is basically showing the, the volume that's being shipped um, internationally over the last, how far do we go back there? I think to the 70s. Um, and then the, uh, the, the bar graphs show the, uh, the, uh, the number and size of spills. So we've certainly seen an increase in oil being shipped, but the, the number of spills has gone down. And, and that bottom graph uh, reflects the same. Um, you know, we don't necessarily, I mean, that's, that's encouraging. Uh, it doesn't mean we don't have to be less prepared, um, but it does show you that those safety systems have, um, have had an impact. All right, so what I'm going to go into now is um, sort of how we fit into this, this larger structure. Uh, so focus kind of on Western Canada Marine Response as, as an organization. We, um, we started in, in the mid-70s. At uh, that time in Vancouver Harbour, there was a lot more uh, refineries. So Imperial had a refinery uh, at the time, Pet Petro Canada, there's Texaco. Uh, Chevron, Shell, they all had, uh, there, there's all, they all had refineries uh, and they all had their own spill response equipment. So we, um, we were formed when these, when these uh, refineries essentially decided to pool their equipment in, into one uh, organization and, and created an industry co-op. It was started as a cooperative uh, back in, uh, back in the mid seventies. And it was only, um, at that time it was called Broad Clean. So it was a different name. And uh, it was only looking after spills in Vancouver Harbor. So its focus was on uh, spills at those, at those facilities. Um, and uh, you know, the rest of the coast was, was pretty much the jurisdiction of the, uh, of, of the Coast Guard. Now, it wasn't until that Exxon Valdez spill that I mentioned did the Canadian government really get involved in spill response. And what happened is the, um, the changes that they made to the Canada Shipping Act basically said that if a vessel is of a certain size, it's, it's calling on a Canadian port, it must have a membership with a response organization that will clean it up on, on their behalf. So what that means is these vessels that are coming in, uh, they're, all our, they're, they're, they, they're all our members. So they pay a fee, an annual fee into the organization that, um, uh, that's our operating costs for the, uh, for, for the year. And then if they have an incident, we're, we're, we're going to clean up that spill on their behalf. And the same goes for oil handling facilities. So you have the vessels as one potential source of pollution, and then you have an oil handling facility as another potential source of pollution. So those, those terminals that we talked about, uh, whether it's you know, the Trans Mountain or whether it's uh, Suncor, uh, they're loading vessels, there's oil going over the dock. So we charge them uh, something called a bulk oil cargo fee. It's basically a, uh, a toll a fee uh, on the volume of oil that they ship. So that's, uh, that's where our operating costs come from. And then if, if any of those members have an, have an incident, have an accident, it is that specific polluter that caused the accident that will pay for the, uh, the cleanup. If they decide that they are gonna try to shirk that responsibility, or if they don't have enough money, because um, it's not only these large companies that you know could be potentially sources of spills. It could be a small, uh, small tug operation that uh, that doesn't have the funds. There is a industry fund um, that will then uh, cover those costs. As a Canadian, there's a Canadian one and, and, and an international one as well. Um, so that's that's the uh, that's the system that uh, the uh, the vessels have to pay into. 
And then what, uh, what, what has to happen on our side is Transport Canada sets out certain planning standards uh, that we have to meet and then they certify it. So um, essentially our regulator, if you will, the person that does the certification is, is Transport Canada. That's, uh, that's who, who we are be, beholden to. And uh, basically what you're looking at here, this map shows us what the um, response planning standards were when they developed them in, in the mid nineties after, after the Exxon uh, Valdez. So if you're looking at the Port of Vancouver, we have a, a maximum six hour response time uh, in that zone. And as we move out into the, um, the, the Georgia Strait and the Montefiore Strait, uh, we're looking at 18 to 72 hours uh, in, some, in some cases. Uh, these, don't, uh, these don't reflect our, our actual times today. In, in, the, in the green zone, we're roughly about, uh, uh, on average, about an hour over the, last, um, over the last 10 years. So there's how fast we have to get to a spill site. And then there's also uh, um, how much we have to be able to clean up. So we have to have enough equipment to clean up a 10,000 ton spill in 10 days. As, as the measurement. So if we, if we had a larger spill, let's say it was 15,000 tons, it would take longer than, than 10 days. Um, so those are the, the, key, um, the key measurements that Transport Canada looks for uh, is, you know, how fast to, to, the, the, to the spill site and how long to, to get it off the water. Now these, uh, these, these response times are, are woefully out of date. Uh, if you, you know, and, and, and we have had to do this, go to speak to someone in Port Renfrew and say, oh, don't worry, you know, you've got three days to get to your community to clean up a spill. That's not a, that's not, uh, that's not a, that's not a good conversation to have. And uh, uh, these need to be, these need to be changed. And I'll talk about how we're going to be doing that uh, a little bit later on. So to meet those, meet those requirements, this is where we um, uh, currently have our, our equipment, our bases. So a, uh, a triangle is where we have um, a base. So a base for us is essentially anywhere there's people and, and, and vessels. So we have one up in Prince Rupert. Uh, we've also recently um, established a presence in Kitimat. We are supporting the construction phase of the LNG Canada project. Um, so as they're moving equipment around, you know, their spills can happen. So we have uh, a crew up there to, to manage that side of things. And as we move down to where we saw through those earlier maps where the bulk of the, the traffic is, we've got more assets. So uh, we, we've had a, a presence in, in Vancouver Harbor for a long time and then over on, on the island and Duncan was our main uh, base for a long time. The orange dots are where we have uh, equipment caches. So this is where there might be a vessel station or a sea uh, cam with boom in it. And so we train local contractors in those areas to, to access and deploy that equipment um, as we're mobilizing from, from another, um, uh, from one of our bases. So for example, uh, I think it was two years ago now, there was a um, fishing lodge that ran aground in, in Haida Gwaii. We had local contractors that, um, that accessed the, the boom that was there uh, in, in, in Masset, um, and sorry in, sorry, in Queen Charlotte. And then our, our bigger vessels were coming over from uh, Prince Rupert. So I've talked a lot about Transport Canada. Um, the, uh, the other main player on, on the federal le level is, is the Canadian Coast Guard, obviously. So we work very closely with the Canadian Coast Guard. Um, they, uh, they have the authority to activate us. So if there's a, a, what we call a mystery spill, often there'll be sheen in the water that uh, no one knows where it came from. If it's significant enough, um, the Coast Guard could, could, uh, can activate us. So uh, they are essentially the, uh, um, the on scene, they're, 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 the, they're the, the main, they're, they're in charge basically on the water. Transport Canada is kind of in charge in terms of the regime and, and Coast Guard is in charge on, on the water. Uh, they also lead cross-border exercises. So there's treaties uh, between Canada and the US that they, they lead those exercises. Um, and then uh, they, are, they are in command um, during this bill. We, uh, we also work closely with Environment Canada in terms of the science behind spills. So not only when I'm talking about the science, I'm not only talking about how the oil behaves in the water, um, but also uh, what are the sensitive areas along the uh, along the coastline that we need to that we need to protect. So Environment Canada is a, a key key player there. 
Ministry of Environment, uh, another one, and uh, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans is also important during that during the incident. And then we uh, obviously we're the response organizations and, and we uh, do our exercises and whatnot. So I talked about the funding. We've got uh, about 2,300 members um, all told, and that's through those um, those two buckets, the vessels and the oil handling facilities. We also have something called subscribers, which is uh, organizations that don't legally have to have a membership with us, but they see it as a good business practice. So Harbor Air is, is an example of that. Uh, they, uh, they have, um, uh, no, obviously they have fuel for their planes. Uh, they don't, they're not covered under the shipping act, um, but they still have a membership with us. All right. So next we're, um, we're looking at, uh, exercises. Um, and, uh, this is part of our certification. So when we, when we are demonstrating Transport Canada, how we, how we, um, can meet their standards, we do these, uh, tabletop exercises. And that's the picture you're looking at there. Uh, we use the incident command system, which is a, uh, a system that's used for emergency response from forest fires to, to floods, to earthquakes. Um, so most, uh, most people in emergency management are obviously very familiar with that. Uh, we, we run spills the, uh, the same way. So some of our exercises are these tabletops and other ones are on water where we're actually deploying vessels to, uh, uh, to meet the needs. So this next series of slides is uh, a um, uh, selection of our di the different types of vessels, different class of vessels. Um, I'll spend the most time on, on this one. It's uh, what's called an oil skimming vessel uh, or, or an oil spill response vessel. Uh, these are purpose built to clean up oil. This is basically like your fire truck for, for oil spills. Uh, what you can see here is it's essentially, it's, a, it, it's kind of like a transformer. It has two modes. When those um, boom arms, and so there's the, the, the metal boom arms that are coming down to the water onto the float, and then there's the yellow uh, boom that's, that's sort of uh, being unfolded there along the side of the vessel. So typically those are stored on the deck. And when they're on the deck, uh, it's a very fast boil. It goes about 26, 27 knots. So when it gets to the spill site, the, uh, the crew use the crane to extend those boom arms on either side. You can just see just above the water line underneath the word spill, there's a little trap door that's opened up. And then this vessel now will, will basically, if you see it from the top, it looks like a giant V and it will now go into the oil. It's like the oil comes and, and it's, 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 it's on the, it floats on the surface. It comes into that chamber there that's open. Then there's actually two of the chambers. And on the, uh, on the inside uh, of that chamber, there's something called a skimmer. And it's a very simple principle. Uh, it basically looks like a conveyor belt with a brush on it, and it will rotate through the oil, and the oil sticks to those brushes, and then it's literally just skimmed off. Okay, there's a there's sort of a grater that just skims it off. So these uh, there's there's two, uh, one on each side of the vessel, and uh, when you're skimming, you're going a lot slower. You're going maybe two or three, you know, maybe two knots. Um, and, uh, but it, it can, it can recover about 30 tons of oil per hour, roughly this one. Uh, this one also has infrared cameras on it. So you can use this at night. You can see the heat signature of the, of the oil at nighttime. This is a landing craft. So when you're doing remote, uh, beach work, uh, this is how you're getting your equipment to the, uh, to the site. These are, um, a new type of vessel for us. They're called a coastal response vessel. And uh, we had them purpose built by Robert Allen. And the main function of this vessel, it's not, it's not a fast boat, it's not a skimming boat. It's designed to be kind of slow and steady, get there in any kind of weather condition type of boat. Um, so it's, it's quite wide uh, and slow and steady. So it only goes about 10 knots, but it can handle the, the heavier weathers that we see, particularly on the, the west side of Vancouver Island and, and uh, up north. This is a response barge. So it not only does it hold oil. So when you're, if you're, um, you know, w working on a spill that's that's far offshore, you need some place to hold the oil as you're skimming it off the surface. So this will hold the oil. It also operates as a uh, a platform as well. Uh, this is this is a standalone skimmer. So I talked about the skimmer on the vessel. We can also have the standalone one. Uh, this one is made by Aquaguard, which is a, a company out of uh, North Vancouver, and this one can skim. Uh, 150 tons of, of oil per per hour. This piece of equipment is called a, a current buster. 
the the mechanics of uh, of spill response haven't haven't changed too much over over the years. Uh, you're basically using boom to collect the oil and, and skimmers to remove it. Uh, this, this, however, is a sig pretty significant um, improvement in, in uh, sweep systems. So it was developed by the Norwegians and essentially innovation here is just how fast we can pull this through the water. So I mentioned before, you're no typically going you know, quite slow when you're skimming, uh, sometimes as slow as 0.5 knots. Whereas with this, you can go about 10 times that speed. So it's a lot faster and it's a lot, uh, a lot uh, it can handle the he heavier weathers as well. So uh, these, are, these are about $600,000 for, for one of these systems. All right, we'll, uh, we'll switch gears a little bit here and to uh, get into our, uh, our mapping program for, for identifying sensitivities ahead of time in, in a spill for the, for the whole coast. So this is our, our coastal response program. Um, and essentially what it is, is, is it brings a number of different initiatives that we have within our, um, uh, within, within spill response under one umbrella, um, and then involves communities, First Nations, coastal communities in, in helping us to, uh, to identify um, sensitivities along the coastline. So what's uh, the basic principle of it is we, um, we can bring in data sets from uh, a, a number of different uh, sources from, from the province, from Environment Canada. Um, and these data sets could be looking at environmental sensitivities. So, you know, where's the eelgrass, for example? Uh, where are the seal hollows? Where are the uh, migratory birds? So we bring those data sets in and then uh, cultural uh, information too. So we have archeological data sets um, that help us identify cultural sensitivities from clan middens to burial sites. Uh, and then um, obviously economic sensitivities as well. So marinas, harbors, those, those types of places. And then once we bring all those data sets in, we layer them up and, and sort of flag the, uh, the sensitivities on the coastline. And once we've identified uh, where the, the uh, program tells us the sensitivity, then we bring in uh, the community. So we'll have a workshop. Um, and so for example, on Bowen Island, we would, uh, uh, we bring in groups that have expertise in that area and they would, you know, they would point out areas that, that we might have missed or that the application might have missed. So they might know that there's a particular, uh, you know, sensitive uh, I don't know, bird, bird area that, that, we, that, we, that we miss. So we're able to then input that data manually as well. And it develops these one page documents called a geographic response strategy. So that, that red line there, that's the boom. So that's, that's uh, where you'd actually physically put the boom and anchoring it on the shore. Uh, this tells us you know, what we're protecting. In this case, it's, it's eelgrass. Uh, it tells us how much equipment we need to do this strategy. So we do, you know, is it a one boat strategy, two boat strategy? How much boom do we need? So we know all that information uh, ahead of time. And then that's all plugged back into our mapping program. So this is what a, a screenshot of the mapping program looks like. And every single one of those uh, purple dots is that one a one page document there. So if we uh, if we had a spill, uh, let's say um, near uh, near Gabriola, um, we could run a trajectory model. We know where roughly where the oil is going to be headed to which sensitivities we can deploy um, either our crews or we've also trained local local responders uh, to access our equipment and deploy those protection strategies. So they're protecting their own backyard. So this would be an example of a, a coastal response package that's, that's located right in the community. Uh, they're, they're trained to access it and inside is about 1700 feet of, uh, of boom to, to deploy strategies. So this is just an example of, uh, in this case, I think they're doing shoreline flush training, um, but uh, we, do, uh, we, do, we obviously do quite a bit of, of contractor training as well. All right, so the Trans Mountain Project. Um, we'll be pretty familiar with this, uh, this map by now or this area of the coast. Uh, again, those, those international shipping lanes. Um, but when Trans Mountain began their project, they, they came to us and said, you know, we would like as part of this project to essentially enhance or improve spill response. You know, what, what can we do? Uh, and they'd run some risk assessments. They had DNV run risk assessments, probability risk assessments. And we said, you know, look, there's, there's, uh, you know, just, just like a, a um, uh, fighting a, a wildfire or forest fire. There's a lot that's out, outside of responders control, but what is in the responders control is, is uh, how fast you can, can deploy to a scene. 
And to improve response, you, you really need to, to have more assets closer to, to uh, uh, where the risk is. So what we did is we proposed that we change the response time requirements. So now if we're looking at the Vancouver area now, we propose, propose going from a maximum six hours down to a maximum two hour response for Vancouver Harbor. And for the entire shipping lanes going from that 18 to 72 hour response down to a maximum uh, six hour response in that entire area. So if you're going from 72 hours down to six hours, you need a lot more equipment and people. So this is, this is our main initiative. It's been our main initiative for the last little while. Uh, it is, um, uh, we, we call the, the Marine Soil Response Enhancement. And it's, um, it's adding uh, about six to eight bases, roughly depends on how you, what you classify as a base, but eight, uh, six bases, new bases for the coast. Uh, most of them are on Vancouver Island. And along with those bases, uh, we'll have moorage vessels and, and, and new personnel. Uh, so if we start in, in Nanaimo, Nanaimo will be the, what we call the hub base. So it will support all the other satellite bases on, on Vancouver Island. Uh, so uh, 35 full-time staff there, uh, 19 vessels, and uh, it'll have a command post, a training center and, and whatnot. So it, it has begun construction. Uh, we started construction um, kind of early October. And it'll take about a year for that base to be done. And going over to Port Alberni, our main base for the west side of Vancouver Island will be in Port Alberni um, because of the port facilities there. But um, because it is far from the open ocean, we have vessels that are forward stationed in Euculet to, uh, to, to, to support that. So that's our, our west coast solution. As we move down uh, Beecher Bay, which is quite near uh, Souk or Machosan, if you're familiar with that area of the world, and so we're, uh, we've, we've got an agreement with the Beach of Bay First Nation for our base uh, at that particular spot. As we move on to over Victoria, what you're looking at there is something called an offshore supply vessel. So that is a large uh, vessel that typically you see servicing offshore oil platforms. Uh, we don't have that industry here on the coast, obviously, but those types of vessels have proven to be very useful for store response. So we'll be adding one of those uh, at Victoria. Uh, and then Sydney is orange because it's uh, staffed 24-7 uh, and that will uh, look at uh, sort of like the Gulf Islands will be its main territory. And then over on the mainland of uh, Vancouver Harbor, we'll have a base also 24-7 and, and the uh, Fraser, Fraser River. So these ones I can go through quite quickly. These are just artist renderings of what those bases will be. So the Nanaimo, um, Port Alberni, Morage for Euculet, uh, new marina, um, new docks at the marina in Beecher Bay. And this is at uh, the Sydney International Airport is where this base will be, and then the Vancouver Harbor base. So essentially we're doubling the size of the organization um, in some places more than that, but uh, we were going from about, about 80 to about 200, 220 personnel when, when we're all done. And same with the, the fleet, we're going from about 45 vessels to, to almost 90 vessels um, all told. How are we doing for time? Ooh, okay, I'll, I'll try to speed this up a little bit for the, for the group. Um, so this is where um, I've kind of collected the the, the questions I get the most um, or I hear mistakes about. Um, and uh, the number one by far is that we cannot clean up diluted bitumen. Um, the, um, I'd, I'd imagine most folks are familiar with that. Uh, it's the bitumen, the product that is uh, that comes out of uh, Alberta, Northern Alberta, and is what's um, shipped, uh, is gonna be shipped through the Trans Mountain Line. It is the bitumen itself is too is too thick to flow through the line, so it, it's diluted with a, a, a number of different types of substances. So you can have uh, you know, dill bits, sin bits. There's all 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 number of different things. Um, but because of that because of that mixture, um, early on there was there was this um, idea that caught hold that basically as soon as it's spilled, uh, the dilutant just disappears and it, it reverts to bitumen form and sinks like a rock to the to the bottom of the ocean. And, and this is simply not the case at all. Uh, so not only do uh, we have real world experience with uh, diluted bitumen, clean up diluted bitumen. Uh, there was a pipeline rupture from the Trans Mountain Line uh, when a backhoe hit it uh, in Burnaby in um, 
ooh, 2007, I believe. And so about 100 tons of that, so a fair amount, uh, got into the storm drains and came out into to Burrard Inlet. Uh, so it would have sediment in it, all kinds of stuff. Um, and our, our existing uh, brush skimmers work, work very well with that product. So we, we know we can clean it up. Uh, we dragged the, uh, the bottom of the inlet with, um, uh, with Zorbent and did not find any oil uh, down there. So there is a real world experience there. Um, and I'll talk about the, the research side of it as well. There's been a lot of uh, uh, time and money at the Canadian federal level uh, looking into uh, Dilbit uh, behaviors. We'll talk about that. Um, so yeah, so you often hear that we need more research and, and that might've been the case, you know, back in 2013, but the Canadian government has done a lot of research in this area. So um, since 2012, um, there's been um, more than, you know, 60 peer reviewed papers, $41 million have been earmarked. Um, and then some more than 30 have been published by external organizations. So a lot of, a lot of research has gone in there and, and uh, if folks uh, are interested, I have, I have, uh, I have plenty of, of links to share with people who are interested in this, in this kind of stuff. And then there, we're not prepared. Um, you know, we, we've, we developed more than 600 of those GRSs. Uh, there's been a lot of work done, not only through our organization, but through the Coast Guard in terms of developing integrated response plans, bringing communities into spill response, more risk assessments. Um, a lot of money has been, uh, been, been put into um, into the coast through the Oceans uh, Protection Plan, which is a federal initiative that the Trudeau government announced. Uh, we don't get any of that money because we're, we're strictly industry funded, but it has gone a long way to make a lot of those organizations whole again. Um, so we've seen the, uh, the fruits of that. So one, one area you can look if you want a little bit more info on, on um, diluted bitumen and its behavior. So the first place is Dr. Heather Detman uh, with Natural Resources Canada. So it is, it is illegal to, to put um, oil into the ocean to test it. So they do have to uh, rely on uh, simulated conditions. So uh, Natural Resources Canada spent money building a, a, a test tank that could simulate not only wave action, so uh, you know, churning up the water, uh, but also different sediment loads. Um, so they would put the dilbit in there uh, and churn it up, put sediment in there. And with their test, even after three weeks, which is long after we're supposed to have cleaned it all up, uh, the, the, uh, the tendency was for it to float. Now, you can have conditions where a deal bit will sink, and that applies to any of your heavier oils, whether it's the bunker sea we're talking about or crude. Um, we saw, we've seen it sink in um, Kalamazoo, which is a river, uh, so it's less likely to sink in seawater. Um, but with rivers, you not only have the fresh water, uh, but you also have a lot more sediment. So if you have uh, water that's being mixed up and a lot of sediment coming into, uh, into the oil, you are gonna have, it is gonna get heavier and it is going to, uh, it is going to sink. Now, the, the most likely place that that would happen in, on the West Coast would basically be at the mouth of the Fraser River. Um, if there was a heavy storm, uh, spring freshet, that's a situation where you could see oil sink. Now, when you do have sinking oil, um, you can still clean it up. So it's, it's a lot harder, it's a lot more expensive, uh, but it can be done. So uh, what you would do is um, first you have to track it. So there's um, different uh, techniques from side sonar to, uh, uh, to LIDAR to a bunch of different, uh, induced polarization is another way that they've, they've looked at tracking um, the sunken oil. So once you've tracked it and you've found it out and you've mapped it, uh, you have a number of options. So you could, you could potentially dredge it uh, you could potentially try to um, uh, refloat it. So they've had success blowing, basically blowing air down and, and refloating it back up to the uh, surface. Uh, you can also send divers down uh, with basically vacuum, vacuum tubes. WCMRC would not be doing that. We'd be hiring a, uh, like a, a diving salvage firm to, to do that. And we would be supporting uh, through pumps and whatnot, but you can, you can clean up the, uh, the sunken oil. Um, so, so uh, Natural Resources Canada done a lot of research. Also, the um, Environment Canada, uh, DFO. Um, there's, there's been all, all these, all, all these federal agencies have done a lot of research into, into this. Um, so, I talked about the Oceans Protection Plan. Uh, they've, uh, the Coast Guard's got a lot of money. They have now have two emergency towing vessels on the west coast. Um, so, these are vessels that. Um, 
uh, essentially it was it was triggered. There was a couple scares. Um, one was uh, up in Haida Gwaii, uh, a, a Russian cargo ship called the Simashir uh, lost power, uh, heavy 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 winds, and was drifting freely towards the west side of Vancouver, uh, west side of Haida Gwaii. Um, and if it if it had uh, if it if it had uh, ha had an accident and spilt, it would have been it would have been terrible. Uh, it would have been extremely hard to get to, very remote, very, uh, very heavy waves, very hard to access, very hard to clean up. Um, so it was uh, fortunately at the, at the last minute, a, um, uh, a Coast Guard vessel was able to throw a line and, and, uh, and just pull it off enough that eventually an American tug came and pulled it into uh, the Port Prince Rupert. But um, it's, it showed that the Canadians don't have the towing capacity uh, for that size of a vessel. So the idea with these these two um, emergency towing vessels is that they can tow basically any size vessel that that we that we would find uh, in Canadian waters on the west side. So the one the one vessel um, is patrol sort of the uh, the north coast, and the other one patrols the west side of, of Vancouver Island. So a number of initiatives. The, the Oceans Protection Plan is a bit of a misnomer. It's more it's more of a, it's more of a, a series of initiatives. There's about 50 different initiatives that that are, that are happening through it. Um, I mentioned the risk assessments and response planning, uh, more radar coverage, marine protected areas, community response, so money is for communities uh, to, to buy, buy, buy vessels, uh, Coast Guard Auxiliary um, has more funding, so a lot of different things happening in that area. So my last set of slides here is a, um, just a kind of a, a look at where, where we were in terms of equipment on stuff on the coast in 2016. Uh, so this is WCMRC in 2016. Uh, this is where we'll be in 2022. So after those enhancements are in. And then if we add in what the Coast Guard has, uh, this is them in 2016 and where they're going to be in 2022. So a huge, huge change in terms of how much assets are, are, are on the coast of, uh, uh, of BC just in the last uh, six years or so. So that, um, that takes me to the end of my, my presentation. I went a bit over what I thought I would be doing, but um, hopefully there's still time for some questions. I, I'm not sure maybe I can turn it back to uh, Val or Victoria to, to, to moderate or whatever you guys want to do. Val, do you want to unmute yourself and moderate? So, um, yes. Well, first of all, thank you very much. That was very thorough and... Uh, you answered a lot of the questions that I gave you. So thank you. You obviously put those into your talk. I found it <laughs> very interesting. Um, so first of all, are there any questions? No? Well, I, I have some. Um, the US side, you know where the border goes and then the US waters with the San Juan Islands and all those. Well, oil doesn't recognize any water borders. So does the US have similar sorts of cleanup things on their side? Oh, Bill, I can't get it out. Damn. Yeah, they, they do. Um, they, uh, they, 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 the lessons that they learned from Exxon are very similar to the Canadian lessons. So the, the regime is similar on both sides. Uh, so they have, uh, they've got uh, MSRC, which is the equivalent to us, uh, which is a, um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a, a national spill response organization for them. Uh, they've got uh, similar to equipment. They've got, uh, they've got large uh, offshore supply vessels in their fleet. Um, there's, uh, there's a number of other um, uh, for-profit response organizations. And there's also um, um, some volunteer ones as well. So the uh, the coordination is um, is done at the uh, the Coast Guard level. So that was the Canyus Pact um, uh, piece that I talked about earlier. So every two years, the Canadian U.S. Coast Guards uh, do a simulated exercise uh, where we work together with them, um, not only the co the Coast Guards but the response organizations uh, as well, uh, so that you can uh, practice that collaboration. Because as you say, the 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 uh, oil certainly doesn't know borders. So, uh, and that's been, that's been going on since the, the mid seventies. So there has been that level of cooperation. Yeah. And you mentioned the manning of the stations that the two in what Victoria and, and, and 
Vancouver uh, 24 hours. So what are the others? Yeah, so we, 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 we're, we're still, we're always on call 24 seven. Um, so, you know, we get, if there's a spill tonight at one o'clock, uh, we're all, we're all responding to that. Uh, the difference is that uh, we'd be coming from our homes. Whereas with those two bases, they'll, we'll actually have staff at the base 24 seven. Okay. Yeah. And so they would be able to start the process and yeah, it just it, it, it expedites the it, it just cuts down those response times again. Yeah. So uh, there, there there was a spill in Vancouver Harbor at one point that everyone was very critical of. So when was that? That was the Marathasa in twenty fifteen. So right. the um, the concern there was a couple 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 pieces. One. Um, the municipalities and First Nations were not happy with um, uh, when they were notified of the incident. Um, and it also took some time for a Coast Guard to decide it was a significant spill and call out, call out us, essentially. Um, now, so there was a lot of, um, uh, the, yeah, the, politically, the, the municipalities were very upset about, about how that unfolded. Um, what we saw come out of that is something called integrated response planning. So now the Coast Guard led a um, planning initiative that actually brings in the municipalities and the First Nations into the planning process. And then that's now been applied to the, the entire coast. Um, so that's gone you know, some way to, to address those concerns. Um, but for, 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 for context, um, that, was, uh, that spill was, was three tons. So it was a very small spill. It was a bunker spill. Um, and I think it was off the water in about seven, 17 hours. So, from a spill response side of things, uh, it was it was quite minor, but you know politically it, it was a very contentious spill for sure. Okay. And I have a couple of questions. Yes. Hi. Thanks, Michael. That this has been a very interesting lecture. Um, I understand that the industry standard for for uh, spill cleanup is ten to fifteen percent. Is that true? Uh, yeah. So they they've measured. Um, the, in, the International Tanker Federation has kept data on spills. Um, so typically the spills they're looking at are, are spills in the, uh, in the open ocean. Um, so often those take a long time to get to. So the, uh, a number of things happen when the oil spills, it's, it starts to uh, evaporate. So some of the product, like a diesel product, for example, marine diesel, um, almost you'll almost get 0% because essentially it, it, it evaporates. The heavier, the heavier stuff is pers persistent, so it stays along, like stays longer. So that's more, that's more easy to clean up, and you actually, you'll actually get more of that. Um, but also, the product does biodegrade. So in addition to evaporating, some of it will break down into into the water column. Um, so it, it it is it is going to depend a lot on um, the conditions, the type of oil. We've had spills where we got zero percent because it was diesel and evaporated, and then we've had spills where we got ninety percent, like the uh, the broad inlet spill that that I, that I talked about. Um, but I think the challenge there is people hear that number uh, and they say, "Oh, well, you you got fifteen percent. That means you didn't do a good job." And there's you know there's eighty five eighty percent of the oil sitting on on the bottom somewhere, and that's that's not the case. It it has it has uh, it has biodegraded. There are microorganisms in the in the ocean that have evolved to consume oil. And that's one of the founding um, sort of ideas behind the use of dispersants. We didn't we didn't talk about that um, because we don't we don't plan for them in, in Canadian waters. They they're they're not approved. But essentially, dispersant. The idea with a dispersant is you break it down off the surface so that it gets into the water column uh, where these microbes will uh, will digest it. So um, yeah, so it's it's gonna you know how much you how much you recover is gonna depend on a lot of different circumstances. Um, and it's actually, it's actually, the irony is it's actually easier for us to clean up the, uh, the heavier product than it is for the, uh, the lighter product, which like, as I said, typically evaporates. If you see a, if you see a spill um, and it's got that kind of rainbow sheen on it, uh, that's often what we call unrecoverable, where it's basically so thin that it's, it's again, it's just gonna evaporate and you can't even, you can't skim it because it's just, it's, 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 it's very thin on the surface. And I guess I'm concerned about um, the zooplankton and the phytoplankton, you know, that, um, all those very tiny creatures at the bottom of the ocean that are affected by that oil. Um, 
that's a very big concern on our coast. You know, you're speaking of the assets on the West Coast that you have, or our assets are the West Coast. And uh, I, I also am concerned about, um, you're saying that the increase in, in tanker traffic is not that much, but uh, I guess just visually, as, as we leave Vancouver Island to go over to the mainland, we see a lot more freighters that are anchored out. Um, is that not because there is a lot more tanker traffic? Um, it wouldn't be because of the tanker traffic yet because Westridge has not been completed. Uh, so it doesn't go into operation until 2022. Um, so that's not, that's not impacting it. It is the port of Vancouver itself. Um, it has, uh, uh, like I said, it, it has, it continues to see more traffic. It is the second or sorry, the first busiest port, uh, in, uh, in, in Canada. Um, and the, um, the actual, the reason some of those anchorages are, are being used now even further out into the Gulf, uh, Gulf Islands, uh, like Plumper, Plumper Sound, for example, you're seeing more tankers anchored there, or sorry, freighters anchored there, um, is the, um, it's, it's, it's the supply chain. So a lot of those are grain carriers that will go in to, um, to one of the terminals and they'll get a load of wheat, for example, then they go out back out to Anchorage, uh, wait for some other uh, product to come in, they go fill up with that product and they come back out. You also see um, uh, creators that are basically waiting at those um, at some of those anchorages in the Gulf Islands um, until they get a contract uh, because it's free for them to uh, to, to do that. Um, so you know, certainly, I, we're not. I'm not trying to minimize the uh, you know the, the risk to the coast or the uh, uh, you know what what, what the uh, what, what shipping volumes are. Obviously, more 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 volume, more more risk. Um, just simply trying to contextualize it for, for people uh, that uh, maybe not have a familiarity with the, the type of traffic that we see on the, uh, on the coast. Okay, thank you. Uh, just to, if I could sneak in a couple more questions. Uh, one of them is we're concerned about the tidal waters. Um, I'm understanding that there's only a certain time that the tankers can go under the bridge and that's when the tide is high enough to, or pardon me, low enough, it's the other way, but low enough to accommodate that. Um, Cannot that be a source of concern to you? No. Um, so yeah, the, the there is the the time that the the tankers um, transit underneath the um, second arrows is, is it's called slack tide. Um, so it's when the tide isn't coming in or out. Uh, so it's not a depth thing. It's just it's just the the movement through that narrow area is, is it can um, uh, you know be, be cause quite a bit of um, activity, I guess. So. So the, um, they, they only go transit through at, at slack tide. Um, we, you know, it's, it's gonna sound funny to this group, but we, we often say to people, it's not, it's not the tankers that keep us up at night. Uh, the tankers going underneath second narrows have two tugs attached to them um, when they're going under the second narrows. And they've done, um, uh, they've done real world simulations where they've done a uh, engine, simulated engine failure in a hard rudder and those tugs can easily pull those vessels out from from uh, from underneath the bridge to uh, to to safety. So, you know, when when we look at where we we see the risk, it's not tankers because they do have that extra level of of safety on them uh, in terms of the the escort tug. So, um, you know, I have you know I have a, a, a lot of confidence in in that safety regime. Um, but that said, I mean, the reason we're here is is if that stuff goes wrong, we need to be ready. So, you know, we don't we don't we don't uh, we don't look at the risk and say, oh, well, it's going down, so we don't have to worry. Um, we're 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 built for those low probability but high consequence uh, spills, and so that's uh, you know that's our that's our posture when we look at that. And just one last quick one, if I can sneak it in, is um, yep. do you remember the Calgary, the the little battleship that that came up the Georgia Strait? Um, I'm not sure if I do. When was this? Uh, this year. Well, very uh, within a year. Okay. It, um, and it's it uh, through some accident it spilled bunker fuel and uh, very oh. very if none of that bunker fuel was able to be cleaned up and I'm thinking this is recent. Uh, what was the problem in that instance? Uh, yeah, I think I know what you're talking about. Um, there was a there was a navy ship that uh, lost a bunch of fuels going through the Gulf Islands, um, and uh, it was of the marine diesel type that I mentioned, and it essentially evaporated by the time they reported it. Okay, thank you very much. Yep. So, do we have any more questions? 
Well, Michael, thank you very much. Um, I've been, well, I'm sure we all have been thoroughly educated on the, the, the true state sure. of the uh, <laughs> systems of cleanup. So I thank you once again. Yes, uh, you're, okay. uh, you're, most, uh, you're most welcome. And um, if there's any, if people have follow-up uh, questions, uh, Val, you can, you can give them my email. Yes, Happy to, to answer questions. Yeah, yeah. okay. Val, Val, I wasn't very fast on my unmute. Okay, one last question. <laughs> okay, uh, about a year and a half ago <clears throat> in Nanaimo Harbor, there were two of the uh, ships that had been commissioned uh, there. And uh, we were told by the people on them that they would not be functioning until the Trans Mountain pipeline was completed that they would get no more funding until that time. I'm wondering how many of the ships that you, you know, you pointed out where they would be all up and down the coast, how many of these various ships are commissioned and functioning now? Yeah, so um, if I'm, if I'm gonna kind of guess here, uh, there was a period uh, when the, uh, uh, the courts ordered Trans Mountain to stop work on their project. Um, and that applied to our work as well. So the, all those enhancements are funded by Trans Mountain. So the, uh, their, that, their project, it's a toll on their project that, that's funding that. So we were in a holding period for uh, probably about a year. So that's maybe when, when uh, you had a conversation with those folks. Yeah. Um, those, those vessels are the coastal response vessels I mentioned, and they were, um, uh, they were designed locally, but they were built um, over in, in Singapore. So right. when they when they come over, um, they have to be commissioned. Essentially, our our crews have to make them suitable for uh, for use, and they've been uh, doing that commissioning process. It's it's been ongoing. I think it's close to the end now here, um, but they've been you know taking them out on test runs and stuff like that. The um, the the full um, I think they're pr pretty close to being commissioned, um, but all of the, all of the vessels won't be um, won't be in place and fully uh, operational and trained on until the fall of 2022. But it will be kind of a staggered approach. We do have some of the vessels already commissioned; others are still uh, are still a couple of years out. Okay, thank you. It's been haunting me. <laughs> Again, I thank you very much, Michael, and. Uh, We'll let you go and attend the rest of your evening. Great. Well, thanks for inviting me, folks. Come back. Okay, and I will put your email up. Thank you. Music. I'm going to stop recording at this.